All right, welcome back. So now we will start our investigation of gen generative machine learning models. And specifically, we will start with restricted Boltzmann machines. So in generative machine learning, we have the following task. We are given data by examples, for example, images from a certain image database. And we want to learn the probability distribution um, of those image underlying those images or those data points and then have a model that can sample from it and generate new images. So for example, you have an image database of faces and you want to learn the probability distribution of faces defined um, by this database and generate new faces that look like real people uh, or realistic faces in this database but are not actual members of the database. So you want to do more than just learning individual samples by heart. You want to generalize. And um, we will see different types of generative models, such as variational autoencoders, generative adversarial networks, etc. But now we will start with energy-based models, which is an important class of generative models. And um, to be concrete, we will look at restricted Boltzmann machines, which is one very famous and very important classic architecture of energy-based models. And the architecture looks like this. So we have essentially two uh, layers of neurons. Uh, so we have visible neurons, which are mapped to the individual dimensions of our um, our data objects, for example, the pixels in images. And we have hidden neurons. <coughs> and um, the network architecture is such a, a bipartite graph. So uh, the visible neurons are connected to all the hidden neurons and vice versa, but they're not connected within these sets. So the visible neurons are not connected to other visible neurons and the hidden neurons are not connected to hidden neurons. So um, and between these two sets we have um, a weight matrix which defines the strength of these connections. So so far that's all like in a feed-forward neural network with two layers or with, a, with an input layer and a hidden layer. Um, and additionally to these weights we have bias parameters on every neuron. So um, in feedforward neural networks, we also had bias parameters on every hidden neuron. Um, but we didn't have bias parameters on the visible neurons because the visible neurons were just mapped to the actual inputs. But now we also have bias parameters on these V uh, values here. Now, additionally, in the restricted Boltzmann machine, or at least in the standard formulation, the values that these neurons can have are just binary va values. So they are between zero, they are zero or one. And there are also versions of restricted Boltzmann machines for, for other um, value ranges or even, even for continuous activations. But so right now we will only look at these binary restricted Boltzmann machines. Okay, so now we define an energy function um, so a scalar function, which depends on the settings of V and H, so on the activations of visible and hidden neurons. And it's defined as follows. So it's the negative sum of activations of the visible units multiplied with their biases, AI. So whenever a visible unit is set to 1, there will be a contribution to this energy and it can be negative or positive depending on the value of the bias. Um, the same with the hidden neurons. So whenever a hidden neuron is set to one, it's a con there's a contribution to the total energy. And then there's a contribution to the total energy for every pair of simultaneously activated hidden and visible neuron. Depending its its contribution depending on the weight of this pair, and we can also write this as a matrix vector form, as seen here. So we take the scalar product of the bias vector with hidden uh, with the visible neuron, the bias vector with the hidden neuron, and we take this 
um, quadratic form of visible and hidden neurons with the weight matrix. Okay, so this is how we define the energy <coughs> of the instantaneous state of a restricted Boltzmann machine. So we can compute this energy given uh, all of the activations of visible and hidden neurons and the parameters A, B, and W. Now, what do we do with this? Um, so, first of all, every hidden unit, every hidden neuron, can be thought as representing a certain pattern or feature of the data. And we use them in order to say something about the probability distribution of the data that we want to model. So this is very important. These hidden neurons and all of the parameters are very important in order for us to be able to encode or model this probability distribution. But before talking about probability distribution, um, it's interesting to see that this uh, restricted Boltzmann machine is very closely related to the Hopfield memory model. And that's a, f a famous classical model to encode memory in sort of neural network type of architectures. And the Hopfield memory model uses the same kind of energy function, but then instead of trying to sample from it and learn a probability distribution, it's only interested in the minima, in the local minima of this energy function. So there's also a training procedure where um, for, the, for the Hopfield model, we observe samples of your training data, such as images or other codes or patterns or features. And then we tune these parameters A, B, and W, thereby learn this energy function. And then when we use the Hopfield model, we just uh, start from some um, feature vector that maybe is an incomplete part of an image. And then we just minimize this energy. And thereby um, we will find a new pair of V and H in which um, our v vector, so the visible vector, will have been modified and it will have been moved to the nearby attractor or energy minimum. And the idea is that we can use these for things like in-painting or image completion. So let's say you have learned um, the parameters to encode an energy function corresponding to a data set of faces or digits or whatever. And then you show the network a partial digit. So with, let's say, half of it hidden. And you encode the corresponding visible unit activations and then minimize this learned energy. So you allow the network to modify the visible units to the nearby, to the, to the nearest energy minimum or attractor. And then the hope is that it is able to comp make a reasonable completion um, of the visible units so uh, that we recover essentially uh, an image that we have previously learned. Okay, so for using this idea for generative learning, what we now need is the connection between the energy and the probability density. And that's done the same way as we have seen before. There's uh, this idea that we can encode every probability density with an energy function by saying we take the energy function and we define the probability as exponential to the minus energy. And to make this a proper probability distribution, we have to multiply this exponential with a normalization constant, which makes sure that if you integrate over all v and h, um, this function sums up to 1. And <coughs> this is called the partition function or partition sum. <coughs> so this is, a, this is a sum over all visible and hidden states over their respective probability weight, so e to the minus energy. This is, in general, something that we cannot compute explicitly because this sum is simply uh, 
too large. Yeah, this is sums over all combinations of values in V and H. So this is this is a huge sum. This is a com combinatorially large. Um, but we will try to find algorithms where um, for for learning uh, the the parameters of a restricted Boltzmann machine and also for sampling from it where we do not need to compute this partition sum. So usually we try to avoid having to compute this explicitly. Okay, so the task is now, this is our structure, restricted Boltzmann machine. The task is now show to this restricted Boltzmann machine samples from a database of visible unit combinations, so of images or other kinds of codes or, or code words or features. Then adjust the parameters A, B and W such that the probability distribution defined by the energy function of the restricted Boltzmann machine <coughs> en encodes the observed probability distribution. And that means if we take this probability distribution and we marginalize out the hidden unit, so we integrate or sum over all possible values of hidden units, then this marginal probability distribution over the visible units should match what we have observed. And once we have achieved that, we want to sample from this machine, from this energy-based model, and generate new samples of V. So that is the task. Okay, so next we want to investigate the question how can we train and sample from a Boltzmann machine, a restricted Boltzmann machine. And I will give a few ex um, results that uh, I will not derive in detail, but these are standard results, so they can be looked up. And the, uh, the first question I'm asking is, what can a restricted Boltzmann machine represent? So what kind of probab probability distributions can we learn with an, an, a restricted Boltzmann machine? And here we are asking the question, what is the form of the probability distribution P of V? Or alternatively, it's energy representation, which is minus the log of this distribution. And remember, this distribution is the marginal distribution in the visible units or the visible vectors. So that means we take the, um, the probability of a full RBM state, which is defined by the energy of um, the visible and hidden unit configuration as defined before, and then we marginalize out the hidden variables. So we sum over all possible hidden variables. Now that is not easy uh, to evaluate, so we cannot explicitly write down the form of P of V, but uh, something we can do formally is to write down the functional form of E of V, so minus log of P of V, and we can show that it has this form. And what this is here in the right is a so-called cumulant expansion. So this sum here over N is a summation over cumulant. So this is this is an um, infinitely large sum over the cumulants of the distribution N. And this is basically similar to um, um, a representation of the probability density in terms of its moments. And the idea here is um, that the cumulants represent the different orders of interactions of the, the individual elements of the visible vector here. So um, for n equals 1, we just have self-interactions of visible units. For n equals 2, we have all pairwise interactions, etc., etc. And the key insight here is that this expression contains all the cumulants, so all the orders of interactions between the visible units. And that means we can represent, in principle, arbitrarily complex probability distributions in V formally.
So again, this is some sort of universal representation theorem, in this case a universal representation theorem for probability distributions, and it works um, to approximate a given probability distribution in V with arbitrary precision if we are willing to make the number of hidden units arbitrarily large. And then again, as the, as the other universal representation theorems we have seen before, this is a, a principal statement. So it means if we make the number of hidden units arbitrarily large, we can in principle approximate any probability distribution of um, visible units arbitrarily well, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's easy to find the parameters which will realize this best approximation. So in practice, there are other generative networks that do a much better job than restricted Boltzmann machines in approximating complex probability distributions, in particular deep generative networks. But we still have this principle statement that um, the RBM is, in principle, a powerful probability distribution approximator. Now we go to the question, how can a restricted Boltzmann machine be trained? So how can we train parameters A, B and W given a set of observations, so a set of visible vectors V that define um, the, the probability distribution or that represent a probability distribution that has been used to generate them. And so first of all, we write down the probability of a visible vector V under the parameters A, B, and W. And that is given um, by taking the probability of a full restricted Boltzmann machine state, which is E uh, exponential of minus, minus the energy, E of V and H, as given before, and then we have to marginalize over the hidden state vectors h, and we have to normalize this distribution. Now we are interested in the derivatives of the logarithm of this probability with respect to the parameters. Why? Because this is essentially a likelihood of the visible vector v. So with given data and with an expression for the log likelihood, we can maximize this log likelihood over the parameters and thereby train the restricted Boltzmann machine. So we look at the log likelihood and take the derivatives of it with respect to the parameters of the RBM. Now, if we do this, and again, this goes without derivation, we get this sort of form. So the first part here, this comes from um, basically the, uh, the sum over energies here, whereas the second part comes from this normalization constant. And um, if we just insert uh, the expression for the energy of the restricted Boltzmann machine state here and work out the algebra, we get these two terms. So what are these two terms representing? The first term is a summation over hidden state vectors of the conditional probability of a hidden state vector given a visible state vector multiplied by Vh. Okay, so this is... Um, an expectation value of this quantity VIHI with respect to this probability distribution. And this probability distribution is basically for given visible vectors, those we have in the data, sample the conditionally the hidden state vector and um, over the probability distribution of those conditional hidden state vectors compute the expectation value of this quantity. So we can call this expectation value over data, over this data sample of VIHJ. Okay, so that's one component that we need. And the next component that we need is 
this sum. So this sum is overall states of the restricted Boltzmann machine. Um, so it's over the all um, possible visible vectors. So not the visible vector that is given as an input here, but all possible visible vectors and all possible hidden vectors. And we take the probability of this pair, which is e to the minus energy of v prime and h. And um, with that probability, we weight this um, observable here. So this is a expectation value again of the model density or the model distribution, um, which is used here um, over the model distribution and of this observable Vihj. Right, so we, we are looking at the same observable here, Vihj. So this product of the visible unit and the hidden unit activation. And in this case, we take the probability distribution of the data and compute the expectation um, of, of this VH pair with respect to the data distribution and here with respect to the model distribution. So those are the things we need to compute in order to compute these derivatives. Okay, so we are in a in a quite different situation with respect to feed-forward neural networks, for example, where we could just evaluate the the value of the derivatives and then use them in order to update the parameters. Here, these derivatives are expectation values, so we somehow need to sample them if we cannot compute these expectation values explicitly or exactly, and we cannot because these sums here are too large and complex in order to do that. So we need to sample. Um, we, ne we need to use some sort of sampling in order to compute derivatives. Uh, so we will have noise on our estimate of the derivative and then use this noisy estimate in order to update our parameters. Okay, so this is um, this is what we need in order to update the W parameters and we can get similar expression for our A and B parameters as you see here and then we can write down gradient descent learning rules uh, so we have a learning rate beta and we can update parameters W, A and B using these learning rules. So this is in principle the learning algorithm. What we have to answer now is to how do we compute these expectation values given a restricted Boltzmann machine. And we start with this conditional expectation here. So the data-based expectation. So how do we sample this uh, from this probability h given v? Okay, and uh, this is fortunately relatively easy to do. So here's again our restricted Boltzmann machine. And we ask the question, given V, so given a visible vector, how do we sample the conditional hidden vector? Um, so for that, we ask the question, what is the probability of a single element of the hidden state vector to be equal one, given the entire visible vector? And that is equal to the probability weight of this hidden state being one, given the entire visible vector, and the sum of probability weights of it being zero and one. Now, this probability weight is something we can write down by taking the energy of the restricted Boltzmann machine and inserting the value of the visible vector and this condition that the, um, the hidden state vector number j equals 1. Now because we are looking at a single hidden state vector, we don't need a hidden, hidden state variable, we don't need to look at all the other hidden state variables 
and the expression simplifies, if we throw out constants, simplifies to this probability weight here. Exponential of minus bj minus sum over i wijvi. Now we do the same for the probability weight of this hidden state to be zero, and it turns out this is simply equal to one. Everything else disappears. And inserting these two expressions here into this probability, we obtain this result. And this result is identical to a logistic function of bj plus sum over wij vi. So it's simply a logistic function. And that is the probability that this chosen hidden unit here will be 1 given the entire visible vector. And this is now something we can easily evaluate for every j and a given v and then simply sample from it. So this is just a probability for each of these, these hidden units and we can simply sample them independently by generating a uniform random variable uh, between 0 and 1 and then uh, setting uh, the hidden variables to 1 if this uniform random variable is lesser or equal than the computed probability. So we can sample, given v, we can sample these, we can draw independent conditional samples of h. And we can work out the same result for the other direction, that's something we'll need later. So given h, it is easy to sample uh, the conditional values of visible units. And we also can compute the probabilities with logistic functions and then sample from them directly. So that directly gives us an algorithm that allows us to sample this expectation here. Uh, given uh, the visible vectors from the data, we want to compute the expectation of the product v i h j for every i and j and we simply comp uh, we simply call this expectation value s i j so this is what we want to compute here and formally uh, what we want to compute here is this expectation value which is arising from the sum over all hidden vector configurations um, with this probability here and this is what we are sampling now and uh, we can use the following algorithm so we initialize a matrix s which will hold all of these ij pairs here so this matrix s has the same shape as w we initialize it with zero and this is simply where we accumulate our sample estimate of the mean of these values sij so now we go over our data, our visible vectors, vt. Um, we take, for example, a batch of data. And for each visible vector in the batch, we generate a sample of hidden variables given this visible vector. Um, we do this by computing these logistic functions and sampling from them as described before. And then we simply uh, compute the outer product of the visible vector and the uh, sample. And this defines our current sample from this matrix. And we now update the matrix by adding this current sample and accumulate thereby individual samples from this distribution and then simply take the empirical average. So this is our sample mean of VH of these of so so the sample mean of the matrix of all of these SIJ values. Okay, so now looking at this equation again, this is what we want to evaluate the derivative of the log probability of visible vectors, the log likelihood, with respect to wij. 
Now we know how we can compute this term here, the first term. Now the question is, how do we compute the second term? This is not a conditional estimate. It's not doesn't contain a conditional probability. So unfortunately, sampling from this distribution and approximating this model expectation is not as easy. So evaluating this probability here is significantly harder. Um, what can we do? We can give a similar algorithm where we initialize a matrix in which we store our current estimate of the sample mean of the IHJ for every IJ combination. And we do for a number of steps the following. We take a visible vector and we sample conditionally the hidden state vector. We know how to do that efficiently. Then we fix this hidden state vector and sample conditionally, conditionally the visible vector. So then we have refreshed V. And then we go in loops. So we sample H again given V and V again given H. So this will, this is called Gibbs sampling, and this will eventually, for many iterations, sample from the correct joint distribution and give us an unbiased estimate of this expectation. But the problem here is that this scheme converges much slower than the conditional sampling of H given V, for example, that we have seen in the last slide, because now the updates of H depend on V, the updates of V depend on H, so every sample that we draw is not independent, they are uh, quite correlated. So even subsequent um, samples of H, yeah, so we sample H given V, then V, and then again H. So these two subsequent samples of H are, are not independent. They're correlated. And they can be very correlated. In other words, we may need to do many, many such steps, such Gibbs sampling steps, in order to get an effectively uncorrelated or statistically independent even sample of H and of V. So that means this sample estimate here may converge very slowly. And then what we practically do in order to deal with this problem is to simply sample, um, so to, do, to use this algorithm and simply to sample um, H and V using Gibbs sampling, but not let it converge. So that means we will simply repeat this loop small n times, and that is usually a small number. Effectively, we often use only one iteration, and that is then called, so, so doing this not until convergence basically is called contrastive divergence, and um, um, with one iteration it's called CD1, contrastive divergence with one iteration. So this will provide not an accurate estimate of this expectation value, but it will provide a slightly better estimate than not doing this iteration. And since we are using iterative updates of the parameters, the hope is that we just need um, a relatively simple estimate of the gradient in order uh, to keep up with our uh, parameter changes. And uh, we can still converge overall. And this is, of course, now fast because we only use one iteration and it works reasonably well in practice.